celebrating 20 years of possibility. I'm Thomas Zachariah, and I truly believe anything is possible. Welcome to Anything is Possible. These are great stories about great people whose lives prove that anything is possible. Same is true for you. My guest is Thomas Zachariah. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Helen. Well, you were on our program before. You reminded me that it was 2012. That's correct. And now you are the director. So I would like to say you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. I have fond memories of our interview. <laughs> no, but I, I remember the uh, interview that we shared then, and I'm so glad to have you back as director of Oak Ridge National Lab. I want to talk about computers for just a minute. I remember I was invited out to see one of the supercomputers, and so I went. And I get there, and they're taking me on the tour. And I, we're walking through this maze, this network of whatever, these things that look like about the size of refrigerators, and they were all in rows in this big room. And I said, when do I see the computer? <laughs> and the person taking me on the tour said, you're in it. And I remember just marveling that we had the fastest supercomputer in the world. You were part of that. How did you get into that? Why computers? What brought you there? Well, I think uh, like everything in life, it is part of it is you, but a lot of it is just being at the right place, a lot of luck. A lot of great mentors that saw something in me gave me an opportunity. And I just happened to be at Oak Ridge National Laboratory pursuing computational science in materials. And this was a time when computers were transitioning into massively parallel supercomputers, basically using everyday CPUs or now GPUs, connecting them with high-speed network to create world's fastest computers. I was there at the right time, and I caught that wave because after people are very, you know, not very good at change. And so people who are really used to the big vector supercomputers was, were not quick to adjust to the massively parallel computers. And so for a junior scientist like me, there was a lot of opportunity to take advantage of it. And it just opened up the scientific uh, avenues that we could pursue. And then I got fascinated by the idea of building ever faster computers and making Oak Ridge the center of the universe. And we have done that for the last two decades. Tell me about the most current computer. What can it do? What's the scale? And how will you keep up? Well, the current supercomputer, there are two supercomputers that we currently have. It's sort of TikTok. One is actually people are working on it while we are assembling the next. So the Summit supercomputer was the fastest computer in the world just a couple of years ago today the second fastest and the fastest in the United States. And that does the workhorse, that is doing all the workhorse computing for not only scientists at Oak Ridge, but really around the world. Now we are also assembling the next fastest computer, which is Frontier, uh, aptly named because it'll be the first computer to really exceed the exascale or 10 to the 18th numbers of calculation per second. It's going to be blazingly fast. It's an amazing supercomputer. And right now, as we speak, there are about 50 or 60 people working hard at work, really, trying to put the last pieces together so that it can, it can be the next fastest computer for America. Um, I don't know a lot about this, but quantum computing? Mm -hmm. How is that different from this GPU-based supercomputing? So you can think of it this way, you know, uh, when you're doing the current traditional computing, you're using bit zeros and ones to do the calculation. 
in quantum computing at any given time, it can either exist in zero or one. So it, it is a unique property of quantum mechanics. So think of it this way, when you flip a coin, right, until it stops spinning, you don't know it's heads or tails. It could be either. And so it is that property that gives us the unique ability to do tremendous amount of calculation. And particularly a, a certain type of calculation that is uniquely uh, used for, for example, cryptography, so breaking codes, or quantum chemistry, or quantum mechanics. And so we are at the forefront of it. We have, a, DOE has just awarded a brand new quantum institute at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And so we are really pushing the frontier in creating this new computing avenue for science and scientists. My understanding is that the material science may be the future of a lot of things. So how we compute, how you build chips, the, the material science behind that is huge. But in batteries, in battery technology, I saw an article the other day, we, we source lithium in all these different places around the world. Strategically, it could be hard to get to those you know, stores of lithium. But did I see an article where sulfur Mm -hmm. is being used to create batteries that might have a 900 mile life. And talk about all the research in material science that you guys are doing. It's a, it's a great question. Uh, I think that as the economy moves to electric vehicle, energy storage, there is going to be huge demand for storage technology, whether it's for automobiles or for grid scale storage. And historically, we have used lithium ion. And as you said, lithium is a rare earth material and it's not available everywhere. And the big pockets of this material are in parts of the world that are not friendly to us. And so Oak Ridge National Laboratory has been actively involved in research in developing materials. You talked about sulfur. Another material is cobalt. So there are a number of materials that can be used to instead of lithium in order to provide one, a strategic advantage for us as a nation over our adversaries, both economically as well as for national security purposes, but also driving more range through a bigger storage capability. Possibility powered by Pilot Flying J, Covenant Health, Home Federal, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. Coming up, Myself, my predecessors, all of them understand that elections have consequences, and so we try to make sure that the lab remains a political. Now let me jump back to you. <laughs> I just, I get to nerd out and have these great conversations with you. Where are you from? I'm from India, southern part of India, in a place called Cochin. What was it like growing up there? Growing up was, was great. It was an ancient seaport, a natural harbor, so, you know, uh, my name is Thomas, right? I'm one of those St. Thomas Christians, one of the 12 apostles who came to the southern part of India, converted four families to Christianity. One of that happens to be my family. So really? Christianity goes 2,000 years. But it's also- Your family goes yeah. back 2,000 years in Christianity? Absolutely. That is fascinating. Yes, and our services even today are in Aramaic. So if you go to a church, uh, so, so we have that, that culture and heritage, but we also have a 700-year-old Jewish synagogue in the city. We have, you know, mosques. So it's and obviously it's a Hindu nation, so it's got lots of Hindu temples as well. So it's truly a multicultural, you know, a harbor city. So what was your childhood like? Uh, childhood was great. I, I grew up in a in a loving family, extended family but also a business family. So I sometimes I say that, yes, I came to Oak Ridge uh, because of the education that I received here in this country and, and the ability to pursue research. But as a leader, oftentimes some of, the, some of the genetic code, some of the things that you learn when you are growing up also comes into play. So uh, it was very good. Have you had to overcome any major obstacles on the way to becoming the, the person you are today? You know, uh, we all, all of us have adverse, you know, adversities in, in life. Uh, but you know, uh, 
I, I think that uh, we've, been, we've been blessed. Uh, people have been gracious to us. And so um, I have never dwelled uh, on, on, the, on the episodic challenges that I have experienced, but overall life has been very, very good to us. Doc, have you ever faced any discrimination? Uh, without a doubt, yes. You know, it's an interesting thing. I'm a man of color, you're a man of color. Yes. Here in the United States of America, immigrant experience is different than indigenous experience, right? And as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm looking at you and I'm going, I wonder if any people counted you out or made it difficult just because of the color of your skin? Um, I, I think, um, again, I, I, I sit in the, in the amazing chair that I have where really legends have sat, right? And so, Absolutely. And, and so I don't think that I can complain. I really cannot complain. But you know, I have certainly had experiences. I will, I will tell you that even after I became the lab director, um, I was, I'm not gonna tell you which store, but I was uh, uh, in, in one of, I was in a shop and, and I was alone and this gentleman asked me to get the F out of, the, uh, out of his door. Really? And, and so, so I can dwell on it. You asked whether I've had that experience. Yes, I have, but, uh, but, but if you look at the totality of what my experience in this country has been, it has been amazing. Uh, I, I, you know, I have the, the mentality of an immigrant. When you, when you get on that plane, uh, you are leaving everything behind and you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't expect anything other than what your hard work, your commitment, your perseverance offers you. And I still bring that to, to, to my life, to my work every day. I, I don't expect anything other than what I contribute. Uh, Who taught you that? Um, these are all traits that passed on from my parents, uh, right? I've been blessed with uh, my, my family, and in, in many ways we have tried to impart that to our children. You know what? Part of your job is helping to lead a huge organization. Um, you got 5,000 people working with you on big ideas for our national security and to move our nation forward. And it's really important work. I don't, I don't think people realize how important that lab is to America and to the world. You're not just there to run the lab, but you're there to lead us forward. It's a huge job, under the radar. Really important work goes on in Oak Ridge. It's technical, it's scientific, but I think the larger job is developing people. Yes. How have you found the journey in terms of leading, encouraging, and infusing the people around you with possibility? You know, I think uh, it, it is, it is uh, you're spot on. It is really the most important part of leadership. And it's something that I continue to learn every day. And it has been, as we were just talking before, uh, and it, it's something that, uh, that particularly during the pandemic, uh, because of the separation, is something that we have had to continue to learn and reinforce. I'm learning. You know, I have the advantage in that I have the opportunity to talk about an amazing institution that came into being during a time when the world needed it. And it made a difference. It changed the world. It, it won a war. It changed the world. And it happened because 70 to 80,000 people from all over this country, and some immigrants from all over the world, came here in order to make sure that this nation, uh, this part of East Tennessee, was part of that big challenge. And after that, creating nuclear energy, the nuclear navy, uh, isotopes for cancer, isotopes for deep space mission, all those things came out of this, this you know, in the, from the East Tennessee Hills, from this amazing institution. So what I have tried to do in leading the laboratory is to, is to lead and to convey that sense of possibility 
of you know of this what create that that reason why this laboratory was created in the first place and and use that for this new time for new challenges and for a new set of people I want to talk to you a little bit about what's next for you. What do you see on the horizon? Because you are a person that you love growth. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate to lead this laboratory, to be part of this laboratory for 35 years, to lead the laboratory for the last five. And over the last five years, the laboratory has grown by about 700 to 800 million dollars a year. We have added almost a thousand or more staff in the laboratory. These are high paying jobs. We have amazing new facilities. And when I look at my next five years at the laboratory, I would like to build off of what we have created over the last several years and really use the platform, the tremendous people that we have, the, the facilities and the programs, to solve some of the fundamental problems tackling us in energy security, energy transitions, as I mentioned earlier, but also national security. There are some huge challenges facing us, and the laboratory is an important part of it. And the last thing is, as we look at supply chain and onshoring some of the manufacturing, to be part of that solution is really important. Yeah, I know we got to start making chips here. Yes. And I know there's a big push toward that. Absolutely. And the nature of chips is changing. The material science, all of that. So I, I, I know that is, that is fantastic. Most great leaders that I know have an operational code. They have a certain set of core values that I like to say are three things. They're the foundation. Um, it's what you build on. They're the filter, what you make decisions through, and what make you future-proof, right? I would love to know the core values that drive you. The core values that, are, that drive me, as I mentioned, I bring an immigrant's uh, mentality to it, which, which means that I don't take anything for granted. So I don't feel entitled. You have to bring hard work that is core to it, but also a sense of fairness, transparency, equity, consistency. You know, as leader, you always make decisions to move the institution forward for the greater good of the institution and the people within it. But obviously, there are, when you make a decision, you know, there are 5,800 staff at the laboratory. Not every decision is popular. Right. And I always ask, there has to be a true north for all of us so that you can sit like, like right now in front of you and say, this is why we, I made this decision, and this is why this is good for the institution and for everybody at the laboratory, and have that opportunity to say that we are doing this consistently so that people say, okay, even if that is not the, the, the decision that I would have made, I understand why that decision was made. Is it hard keeping the lab apolitical? keeping the politics out of what you do, because science does not need to be political. It just needs to be what it is. Discovery doesn't need to be political. It just needs to be what it is. Is that a challenge at all? Uh, I think for the most part, for the most part, the lab has remained apolitical and has had the freedom to be apolitical. I think our leaders understand the value proposition of these national laboratories, and as leaders, Myself, my predecessors, all of them understand that elections have consequences, and so we try to make sure that the lab remains apolitical. At the same time, you know, times have changed, and so, so there is a greater, uh, enga a greater access to information, greater engagement. So navigating through that is a little bit more of a challenge today than perhaps it was a decade or more ago. A final question I have for you is, um I have so much respect for, for India. Um, there's something that I've noticed in America. There are a lot of people from India that are leading major corporations. Have you noticed this, Trent? Particularly of late. Yeah. Particularly of late. Is there, uh, th there's something, there's a there there in terms of like you said, work ethic, that immigrant spirit. Have you noticed that 
Is that networked? What can you tell me about that? Um, I, I think, uh, for first of all, I think it is just uh, uh, a timing. There are a lot of, uh, many of the Indians who came here, came here for higher education. We started arriving, you know, the 20, 30 years ago. And there was a bigger influx of people in the, in the 2000 era because of Y2K and the need for IT professionals. And so the first and second generation of Indians who came here are beginning to enter the workforce and get into leadership. And so that's why you're seeing not only whether it is TV or food products or certainly technology uh, programs. And, and I think that uh, if I were to look at ourselves, our family, we were blessed with being part of this amazing community. You know, East Tennessee has been welcoming to us, has provided our family with great education. Both our children have done well. Uh, our, our daughter, as I said, is a dentist here in town. Our son is a technologist. He had the opportunity to spend 10 years building a company and, and has sold it and is doing extremely well. And so all those things goes back to the, the community the education, the fabric that we fell into here in East Tennessee. So we have to be thankful to East Tennessee and this embracing uh, community that we were fortunate to be part of. Yeah, we're fortunate to have you as the leader of Oak Ridge National Lab. And uh, I'm glad that we got to spend this time together. I wish you much, much success. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Harlan. Appreciate it.